everyone. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here for the uh, Linux audience. It's such a privilege. Again, thank you. Um, today, I'd like to present to you the bootstrap of the Debian PPC 64 EL port, which I have worked on when I was working for the IBM Linux Technology Center until a couple months ago. This work was performed around 2013, 2014, but it's kind of history, and now that I have changed the jobs, I found it would be a very good opportunity to document how this was done and for and most of the stuff that we have done to make this uh, because ever since me and Breno, who's going to present here, we were either uh, too busy or too lazy to do that. So now I decided uh, we should do that. So here we go. And I'd like to mention this work, or better, this presentation is not associated with any company. I have done this while I worked for IBM, but all views here are my own. So uh, if there's something wrong, it's my fault, it's not any company or neither from the Debian community. So okay, uh, the presentation, I got too excited to tell you a bunch of stuff, so I made two, a lot of slides, so I'll skip some of those, may mainly the history, but we'll go th through the concepts like what's this Debian port, uh, what is a bootstrap, an overview of that process, the techniques that we have used to make Debian work on the, this new architecture, and some of the challenges that we have faced because I guess one presentation is not enough to cover all of the challenges, but uh, a few interesting ones of them is good. So the history, I will just make it quite short. How many of you have known the IBM Power servers, the PowerPC processors? Great. I'm trying to look for how many of you don't work for IBM. I guess one guy. <laughs> cool, because those are more expensive systems and we usually can't afford to buy them or even to have them running in our houses and pay the electricity bill. So uh, at some point in time, because these systems have existed for decades, they use it to run the IBM proprietary Unix, the I AIX, and the IBM I systems. Those were really rock solid systems that would run your enterprise company with very large databases and workloads. And when Linux was initially ported to run there, it was really made to fit that architecture and how that worked over there. And it was not really tied to how Linux worked in the, the rest of the industry, like x86. And at some point, that difference became too different. Some people started calling us esoteric architecture, a weird architecture, or the way that we were doing things was just wrong for them. And when they wanted to move to you know, this new cloud design where we are no longer really scaling up, but scaling out for more systems, wanted to do things more dynamically, like stopping and start servers, restarting stuff, where you can have servers that are less fault tolerant. If a server fails, that's fine. Try the triple error, restart the service, uh, reboot the server, or replace the server, so that's okay. You just want cheaper servers. So they started changing a lot of stuff, and this is how we come to this little engine stuff. They wanted to do something that was easier to, for portability for both hardware, in case you want to interact with GPUs or other cards that are used in other architectures, majorly x86, which is Little Engine, and for software as well. We had a kind of a different ABI with regards to function calls and you know, lots of different stuff. And the engine is as well, power our processors traditionally run in big engine mode for decades. And when you're porting software from x86 or other architectures with your little engine, that poses a big problem. So they said, no, let's do things you know, more how the rest of the industry works so we can better operate with them. And this is how the, uh, something that the Open Power Foundation that Ricardo mentioned yesterday uh, kind of triggered this. So it was really good. So I'll just fast forward here. And let's talk about Debian now. Uh, how many people here know the Debian PC 64 EL port who didn't work for IBM, please? No one. So it's basically the Debian, so, so it's a good slide actually <laughs> to have. Uh, you have to run Debian on this new architecture, which is the PowerPC processors, the server class of them, which run in 64-bit mode, and EL stands for engine is little, little engine. So basically you have all the Debian packages and you want to patch them and build them so to run in this new architecture. 
So this architecture runs on servers made by IBM and other companies in the Open Power Foundation. Uh, it started officially running on Power 8 and later. Um, you may also see this architecture as these strings, PowerPC64 Little Engine as the CPU field in the toolchain platform triplets. You will see PPC64 LE, it's exchanged in the U name, hardware name, and PPC64 EL in the Debian package tooling, which is also in Ubuntu and other Debian derivatives. So what is bootstrap? Uh, it's a term that means this looped strap in a boot where you use it to help you pull the boot on, get your feet into the boots, because sometimes the boots are too tight or too hard to, to wear. And uh, a more, you know, philosophical definition is this adje adjective, which is a means of advancing oneself or something that is self-generating or self-sustaining. It gives the idea that once you have something started, that thing is able to sustain itself into growing into something more, something more complex, something bigger. And the computer thing for this is, it, this is my definition, but you will find similar things defined elsewhere. The bootstrap is a process that you can incrementally build and run software for or on a computer for which there is no software yet. Uh, that is something that to go from the scratch using incremental steps. But we have to be humble here. Nowadays we have other computers that can run software. So instead of doing that from the scratch, you do that from a computer where you already can run some software, like compilers. And you actually have some software in the target computer. We are not really booting from the processor up. We assume that the target uh, computer is able to kind of boot uh, from the processor up into a bootloader or into your kernel. So there's basic boot capabilities over there. Um, when we say that uh, different engineers triggers a new architecture, some people don't really get it. We will talk about it. But there is this other example. Assume you have this brand new computer with a very new processor which has instructions that have never been used. So there is no software on earth that can run on that computer. Everything you have ever built in the mankind history doesn't run there. So what do you do? It doesn't matter if your computer is like 10 gigahertz, very fast, or all that. You have no software. So it's kind of like a stone. It's a brick. You have to be able to put some there, something there, software, to be able to do something useful with that. So, and the compilers are not yet enabled for that. They can't generate instructions for, for that computer. So how do you do that? Uh, you have to start everything over again, really, really. You have to build it all, the toolchain, your kernel, the user space, and more complex applications. And there is this very interesting restriction, which is the bootstrap definition itself. You can only build more stuff using the stuff that you have already built. So it's really something that's self-sustaining. And you must go one step at a time. So the first thing you must be able to do is to generate executable code for this other architecture. And of course, since you can't run anything there, you must do that from another architecture. This requires a cross compiler, or better, a cross toolchain, which also includes assembler, linker, and more stuff. We are full of toolchain people here, so I will keep myself quiet most of the time because they know better and they can tell you better how this works. And this cross toolchain thing, it's very interesting. You can have three architectures involved in this. A build architecture, a host architecture, and a target architecture. The build architecture is the name for the architecture that you're going to build your toolchain on. The architecture where your toolchain is going actually to run and build software on is the host architecture. And the software that your toolchain builds is actually going to run on a target architecture. So have three things. You can, for example, use what's called a Canadian build uh, processor for a toolchain. Say you can build a compiler on your x86 laptop. Your compiler is going to run on a PowerPC server because it has lots of CPU threads. So parallel builds are much faster. And the code that this PowerPC processor 
produces using your toolchain that was built on x86 is actually going to run on your mobile phone on an ARM processor. So it's quite flexible. <coughs> Most of us, fortunately, don't have to deal with this on a daily basis. So on a normal toolchain, all these architectures are the same. You're going to build your toolchain, you're going to run it to build other software, and you're going to run that software on the same architecture, for example, x86 or PowerPC. But on a cross toolchain, some of those architectures are different. For example, you may want to change the target architecture to instead of running on x86 or PowerPC, you want to run on PowerPC 64 Little Indian. So the very first thing you have to do is the patches for the toolchain to enable the new architecture. This is a bunch of work. The toolchain guys do that. Uh, and I, I'm not capable of speaking how that really works. But you have a toolchain guy or a team, and they, they're going to do that for you. So you build the cross toolchain using their patches. So your cross, cross toolchain have the same build and host architectures. Say it builds and runs on x86, but the target it generates is for the PowerPC 64 Little Engine architecture. I'll cover that in more details soon. And now that you have a cross toolchain, you can start to think, OK, I can produce code that's going to run in that new architecture, but how I'm going to run it? And then you now have to start thinking to build the same similar environment that we have on other architectures, like kernel, user space, and all that stuff assuming you want a general purpose OS that needs a kernel and that's not running a simple, you know, speci specific purpose program. So now you cross compile the kernel. And of course, there's lots of patches there to enable this kernel to run on this new architecture. Also, I'm not covering that here, but it's quite a lot of work. Uh, so OK, when you want to run some stuff, you first boot the kernel, and then you run the other stuff. All right, we had the kernel build first, and then you go cross compile user space, which is quite a lot of stuff too, because the kernel is going to boot and then it's going to hand it off to user space, like the init runfs, the init, init system, your login prompt, shell, other tools you can run, and more complex applications. So you go cross compile user space, but well, that's quite broad. Uh, but for now, you want to cross compile just enough of user space. Because once you have a new, a native environment, which is not your cross environment, it's native now to run on the new architecture, you want, uh, once you reach that, and something that you actually use, some, something that gives you a shell prompt, some commands you can run, you want to build and run in native mode as much as you can, because then you can run the software test suites. For example, run make check when you're building software. Because then we'll, you will hit more errors. You can fix them. You can compare you know, if this errors that you're having here already occurs on another architecture. And so you can compare if your toolchain patches and all that stuff is good enough. And if you find some problems that you know keep uh, make changes to your toolchain, for example, you might have to rebuild everything again, because all of your binaries had errors. And, and this is called a rebuild the world operation. <coughs> OK. And so you had this cross compiler to build stuff for the new environment. And, but you want to build there when you actually can use that environment. So you're going to cross compile a native compiler. That is a compiler that is built on another architecture, but is going to run on your native architecture. So can you start building there? It might be a bit confusing to have these both terms on the same phrase, but if you get the idea that a cross toolchain, it's just it going to generate code that runs on the target architecture, you can just think that code is another toolchain that's going to do the same thing, generate code for that architecture. It's just going to do that on that architecture as well. So now you'll be able to run this compiler in the new environment. And once you get that, you might want to rebuild your toolchain natively. So you get you know, some parts of your toolchain code exercise it there. And now our architectures are equal. And uh, some people might say, oh, we already have this native toolchain cross-compiled. Why am I going to build a new one? Well, fair point. But there are some things that are worth doing because you want to get more errors early on. 
You want to make sure your toolchain runs correctly in the new environment because it might have differences with the bit, uh, the bitness like 32-bit or 64-bit, and for engine as well, for big engine or little engine. So it might produce incorrect output if you run it on a different uh, setting. And you want to check whether the new environment is going to run your toolchain correctly, your kernel, your shell environment, your libraries, all that stuff. And all that aside, the toolchain build process is something that really stresses out the system. It's a very big, very long process, which has lots of files and that stuff. So it is a really good test. It's very useful to hit and fix errors earlier on. And of course, you're going to ensure that one of the most important parts of your new architecture, your toolchain, is working correctly. So it's worth the time spent there. OK, great. Now let's build the rest. It should be simple, doesn't it? Because you have the toolchain, you have the search code of stuff. You should just go build, right? Well, not really. Because building stuff just the normal way requires you to have a normal environment with all the build dependencies available. And you don't always have that in your new architecture. When you're going to build, you have to have some packages installed to build. Those are build dependencies. And when you install some packages, it might require other packages as well, which are install time dependencies. And when those are not available, here's where the fun part comes. You can use lots of tricks. Some of them are generic. Some of them are very particular to specific packages. So in order you can build and install and run your stuff. It is a real nightmare at first. Once you get the, the deal of it, it's challenging. But once you get past that and actually have finished the work, you can look at it as an adventure. Breno, am I right? Completely. <laughs> OK, so fun part. Some, some techniques that we have used to do that. The very first thing that we have relied upon is be able to run QMU, KVM, on the power system. And this was something very new at that time. Traditionally, Linux on power systems have always run in virtualized mode under the PowerVM hypervisor, which is proprietary. And <coughs> excuse me. Now we had this OPAL firmware, which stands for Open Power Abstraction Layer which uh, started for Power 7 Plus systems, but that version was only used for development when we didn't have Power 8 hardware available yet. We were actually building it. Um, and it allowed us to make this very good thing that's available forever in x86, I guess, where you can run in bare metal mode and at some point run KVM guests on it. It was an alternative to running under the PowerVM hypervisor. And PowerPC has this concept of the platforms, which is kind of what things your kernel can assume that are under it, how the hardware behaves, what areas of memory it can touch and go run code from, even if, if it wasn't the kernel that initialized that. There's something there. And this something is guaranteed by this platform definition. So the platform for running in bare metal mode is provided by the OPPO firmware, and its name is PowerNV. NV stands for non-virtualized. And the platform that's virtualized is P-Series. P stands for power, for the power series, when IBM had other series of servers, like X for x86, and Z for the Z stream, uh, sorry, for the Z mainframes. And this platform is the same that was uh, specified and run in the PowerVM hypervisor. So it was actually a very good design point because with that, all the software that we had in the past running in big engine mode for PowerVM now should be able to, you know, without little changes, run under QMU in this new environment because it's all compatible. It's emulated by QMU. And using virtual machines like KVM allowed us a much faster cycle to develop things, to test them, of course, crash and reboot the gases more often than not because we're doing kernel stuff as well and other low level stuff. So we must be able to reboot fast. And so it was really good for development. And so as the cross build environment, we used the Debian PowerPC port in a KVM guest. The PowerPC port is big engine and 32 bits, 
we use it that on top of a Fedora, big engine, PowerPC 64, um, <coughs> KVM host with patches for QMU, KVM, uh, the kernel, etc. And mostly because most folks at IBM were used to the RPM based distros like RHEL and SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, which usually run on power systems. So that's what they were more familiar with. So they patched that one first. And so we use that to build this minimal native build host environment. So you can start to run in the new architecture and build stuff there. And now, but it's still in the cross environment. Why we chose that in there? Because we wanted to maximize the uh, reutilization of our patches. Because there, uh, as we mentioned, there are packages that you're going to build several times in the host system and in the target system. So if you have patches that apply just the same, it's better. You don't have to fix two patches when you find a bug. We also want to minimize the differences between the cross environment for building and the target environment for running. Because if you find a problem in the target environment, the first thing you want to do is to check how it works in the cross environment. Is it OK? Is it the same behavior? I need to fix only the new architecture or on both architectures. It's something that helps. And this allowed us to have more, uh, more simple scripts that were more common. You know, on both sides, on the cross side, and on the native side, we could use dpackage, apt, and all the Debian tooling. So the very key part of our project was this Git repository, where we kept our scripts to run the first stages of this, our, the patches to the packages, and the, the definition of our workarounds. They were not really manually. They were part of the code of the scripts itself. So it was a very good idea. Uh, I'll give an overview of the scripts here and go in more detail uh, right now. Um, so the build scripts were divided in more or less five stages. Part zero was used to prepare this build environment, which uh, would run the cross compiler. Part two would build the cross tool chain, which is a very complex process. We're going to get there. Uh, part two would use that cross tool chain and the cross environment to build enough packages to be able to boot and build on the native environment. Part three was already booted and running in the native environment, and it was used to build enough so we could rebuild the tool chain natively. And part four, we were going to build more and more stuff now that we had the tool chain and the source code available. Um, our patches, we organized them in you know, a pair package directory hierarchy. And we had two types of patches. The first one are the normal dot patch files that we use in software development. And those were for changing the source code that's in a package, like the application itself, in case we had to fix something for the new NDNS mode or you know, uh, different bit numbers or the ABI changes that we were making. And also the dot .deb patch files, which were changes exclusively to the packaging part of that uh, source package, which for those of you who know the Debian source code, uh, sorry, the Debian source package format are the files in the Debian directory, where you tell how the package is going to build, which packages it builds, and all that stuff. Um, the workarounds, this was a, a really cool part. We had variables in the shell scripts for defining which workarounds each package needed. For example, we had this uh, package name underline depths variable in case we wanted to remove specific build dependencies from the list of build dependencies that uh, that particular package needed to build. We could use the vars variable to export environment variables when it was building. For example, uh, when you build without a particular build dependency that tells your package where it's going to find stuff, you can say, OK, do not use that tool to do that, but trust these environment variables that I'm, I'm telling you. Go find these other libraries and these other configuration files where I'm telling you, and it's going to build. And also, we could request a specific version of the source code to be built. For example, you have Perl 516, 518, and some, each one of them might be more, uh, simpler, easier to build. So 
if it was good enough for us, we would build that one because it was just simpler. And we could also, you know, build a package in multiple stages or actually build it more than one time, but using different workarounds for each stage. For example, in the first stage, you might want to remove some build dependencies and then build it later when that build dependence is available again. So we could have the very same variables, but now for individual stages. And this was very cool because it allowed our, our script to be very simple. We just had this list of package names with the stages and the variables with containing the workarounds. And we could build packages following just a simple loop, which is for each package in the package list, you're going to download the search query version that uh, we might want to have a particular one. You're going to apply the patches on it. You're going to apply the workarounds on it, like removing build dependencies or exporting environment variables. And you're going to build that package. And if it's successful, you pull that package into our package repository and move to the next package. It was really, really cool. So now some details on those build steps uh, of our scripts. We were using Debian, so the very first thing we wanted to enable was the deep package tool to recognize this new string as an architecture architecture <coughs> and tell it that it was 64 bits, it was little engine and all that stuff. Once we had built the patched the package, we would install it and tell our PowerPC 32-bit environment that it was okay for it to install packages from this other architecture because Debian has true multi-architecture support. You can install packages from other architectures without problems. You, of course, cannot run them uh, in, in, in native mode but you can install their stuff, like things that you're not going to run, source code, for example. And then we use the, the package architecture tool to get some Debian-specific variables for building our cross tool chain and our C library and all that stuff. That basically tells they are not going to run in the, this current architecture where it's building. They're going to run in the other architecture. So, and also we created this package repository for storing our packages. Okay, now it's time for you to take a very big deep breath. Uh, again, we have two chain guys here. They can tell you how you build a cross compiler much better than I do. Uh, but it, 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 it's a quite interesting process. It has lots of details and tricky parts. So if you go download the slides, I have some suggested reading links there. The first one, which is where I use it to recall what we use it to do at that time, is from this cross tool ng uh, tool, which is used to build cross compilers. And it has really great documentation if you want to read that. Uh, I, ref I will mention the third link in that page when I finish my presentation. So I guess it's from Ian Lance Taylor, the guy who wrote uh, pretty, pretty much of stuff. And uh, it's very interesting reading too. I guess I'll grab some water, water before going to this. Okay, fine. Let me tell you, if you can r just run your compiler on your system and it generates code, you're a happy person. The first thing you want to do when you're building a cross tool chain is build the binary utilities, the assembler, the linker, and all that stuff. And then you're going to use that and build what's called GCC stage one, which is GCC, a very simple GCC, sometimes called the bootstrap GCC, if I'm not mistaken, which is enough to build the C library headers and start files. It doesn't need glibc at all, so you don't have that dependency. And it cannot build the complete C library, just some parts of it. And you use that GCC to build glibc stage one, which is itself a glibc that can be used to build the GCC that's going to build the complete glibc later on. As far as I understand, it's just headers and start files which are imported for the C runtime. It needs some kernel headers because the C library interacts with the kernel, so we need to know what C types it's, are, it's using for integer, you know, uh, other stuff how it handles system calls, you know, the threads, like POSIX uh, P threads in, the, in this new environment, how it initializes some stuff when running 
your threads. Then you go and build, use that to build GCC stage two, which is just enough GCC to build the complete glibc. And then you use that GCC to build the complete glibc, and you use that glibc to build the final GCC that can link against this complete glibc uh, and use it. Tulio, is that right? Or approximately right? Yeah. <laughs> Keep me honest. Thank you. So now that you have this cross compiler, you can build packages, right? So what you're going to build, as I mentioned, you want to build just enough to boot a new native environment and be able to build stuff on it. But how do you know which packages you're going to build first? You of course know you have to build the GCC and that stuff, but how do you begin, like the shell, uh, the dependencies of the shell and that stuff? So there is this very useful tool called dbootstrap, which installs a basic Debian suite in a directory from a package repository that you can specify. So how it runs is it has several lists of packages. For example, a more minimal set or a set that you're, going, you're able to build stuff. And if you don't specify anything, it tries to install a base Debian system. So what we done by that time was we run this tool and check its error log. So the next package that it started to fail, we knew it was the package that we had to work on. So at some point, we would have a minimal Debian file system. And this is a command line example of running that tool in, this, in the cross environment. It's, you run the bootstrap, specify the target architecture or you know the package architecture that you're going to use packages from. Tell it it's a foreign architecture. So when it is installing your packages, it's only going to unpack your packages and not run anything like uh, the installation scripts after it installs your, your packages. Because you're obviously running on a different architecture. And if it invokes some binary or processor instructions that are not available, your program is going to fail. Uh, this variant parameter is which package set you want to, to try to install. You can specify a minimal base, we, uh, which is just the essential packages plus apt. The buildd set, which is just the build essential packages, so you're able to build, build. And if you don't specify, it's a full basic Debian distribution. It has lots of packages. You can also include more packages. For example, we run this on a guest, so we wanted basically the HCP client, secure shell, the VI editor, curl for the loading files and stuff. You specify the release, uh, which we were running Debian unstable, and the directory where you want it to you know, install your packages to, and the, the package repository. You can say Debian.org for uh, grab the, the Debian packages, or you can just say, oh, use my local repository here. And this directory that we are installing the packages to is actually a mount point for a virtual disk image which contains our basic native environment. And once you are able to boot and run something in the native environment, you just call the bootstrap second stage, which is then going to run that configure step from the package where now it can run something. And how we, we prepared that environment that we could boot? We just create this disk image file, created a file system on it, mount it on that root directory, run the bootstrap, I forgot to put this in the file, to install the packages into that directory. You create this first boot script, which is just going to remove itself later after it runs, because it should be run only in the first boot. It's going to call the bootstrap second stage to configure your packages, set a root password, and power off. That's all. So when it finishes running, you have your native image configured to run your Debian native environment. So you grab a kernel image so you can run that with QMU and use that disk image that you just prepared, boot it. The first time it runs, it's going to set up itself. And the second time, you are ready to log in as root and go build stuff. Uh, this is documented in more detail in this Debian wiki page which I'm happy to tell you, I have written the first version of that page when I was working on this project. It has, you know, lots more arguments and, and all that stuff for the commands. It's 
Uh, if you want to go into the details of how you do that, it's all there. So okay, now that we have built, you have to build enough to build the tool chain. But you're going to want to do that in this native environment. And again, you can use the lists from the debootstrap tool to keep trying to build the package set that includes the build tools, like GCC, you know, the libraries that GCC uses to build for mathematics and, uh, and all that stuff. So you have to build the dependencies of the toolchain packages and eventually build the toolchain package natively. Uh, and you install it, so you're now using it as your default toolchain. And then when you have your toolchain, you can go build more stuff. But you know, what exactly? Now that you have a toolchain, how do you direct your efforts on what to build? And the Debian community has this amazing build daemon, also known as build D, which automatically builds packages and reports the failures that it has. So you basically have this list of packages from Debian.org, and it tells us, go build that stuff. And it can report to you how it, why it failed. If a package failed for you know, build dependencies were missing, or it had problems while installing those build dependencies, or it had other problems when trying to build, like a package build failure, which is called fail to build from source in Debian terms. And a very important point and very useful point from it is that it reports to you how many packages are blocked by a particular package that's failing. So if you have this library that say 200 packages are depending on, it's that one package, that library, that you want to go fix first, so you will have more 200 packages attempting to build on your build daemon. It's very cool. So once we had that, we just set it loose building stuff, uh, following the Debian archive for new package updates, and when it failed, we were going to fix the errors that it reported. We kind of did that in three stages. First one was exclusively internal at IBM when we were not yet allowed to talk to the community. Most of the stuff that we were doing, it was kind of confidential. And so we used our internal patches. Wait. Eu não estou te ouvindo, desculpa. Duas o quê? Essa é outra palestra. Okay. No worries, never mind. So, the first time that we had done this, we were using our internal package repository and attempting to use our internal pack patches to build. Later, we used our package repository only to satisfy build dependencies of Debian packages <coughs> and using Debian sources, and then we knew we had to fix or you know, send patches to Debian for those particular patches. And once uh, this architecture was accepted as a Debian architecture running on the you know, upstream build daemon, we just went there directly and fixed stuff directly. So, some of the challenges that we had um, faced. Very first one, which was very early during the bootstrap process, was the source code in Debian packages were changing too fast, uh, more than we could keep up with. And sometimes it break our repository when they change the versions of specific dependencies because now the package doesn't install anymore because it can't find a newer version. Or sometimes they you know, change it, the source code, like rebasing the package to a more recent upstream version, and that broke our patches. So when packages stop installing, it's bad, but it's quite okay. We just have to rebuild this package, and sometimes it works. But when your patches stop applying, it's worse because the package is broken, you have to update your patches, which is much more work to do, and then you go try to rebuild it. And the workaround that we have used for that is this very great tool called snapshot.debian.org, which keeps snapshots of the Debian archive at specific timestamps, uh, points in time. So we started using a particular timestamp 
for downloading the source and binary packages from Debian. And so we could port consistently using the same package set at the same versions. And once we had enough packages that allowed us to move to a more recent timestamp, we had done that until we could go to the rolling source code of the Debian archive, which is not a snapshot. Uh, by far the most fun uh, challenge is this build dependencies when they are circular. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, say you want to build package A, but in order to build package A, you need package B installed. But you don't have package B yet, so you have to build package B. And when you go try to build package B, it tells you I depend on package A to build. So we have a problem, you have a loop there. And on bootstrapped architectures, you don't see this problem because all packages are available, at least on a previous version, so you can install everything you want. But when you're bootstrapping a new architecture, it's not the case. This ABA problem is trivial, but it happens quite a lot. But some packages can get very complex uh, chain of dependencies. So sometimes they introduce more packages in the chain, like A to B to C to D, and some point in time they go back to A or some dependency chains are really complex, like you have A, B, C, D, which goes back to C, and a further point in the chain, it goes back to A. So try to break the inner loops first and go, then go to the outer. And at the very end of the process, you have your A package ready. The workaround for that is really to identify which build dependencies are not strictly required, and that is, if you remove that, it's not going to cause the package fail to build. It's just going to report that, say, a feature is not available when it's running configure, and it's going to keep building, give you a less complete package, but it builds, it works, and it can be used to build the other package. So you do that, build both packages, and then you rebuild the first one, which now has both dependencies available. In our scripts, the way we had we done that is like this, in the package list, you add package A with a stage one, and you define a depth variable for it, which tells it to remove package B from the list of its dependencies. So you build a smaller version of package A, then you build package B, and then you rebuild package A without workarounds now, so we can use B as a dependency. And you just tell it to go build, it's going to build everything. There is a much worse case of uh, circular build dependencies, which, which are the recursive ones, when it has a dependency on itself. And it's real. It's not something that you can just remove. Uh, it, it's serious. This is usually the case with programming languages, because the compiler of language X is written in that language. So in order to build the compiler of language X, you need the compiler of language X. So how do you do that? Uh, it's much more difficult. It might involve different workarounds or more than one, depending on what you're doing. You can build a simpler version of the compiler to build a better one later, uh, which is what happens with GCC and glibc, for example. Or you can build that uh, compiler externally, manually, not really using packages, and inject those files in your system, and you just tell the package to ignore build dependencies, uh, you're not, it's not going to try to install them and fail, but it just skips them, and when it tries to run the compiler, it magically exists in the system, so it doesn't fail. Or you can build the compiler using alternative compilers, and this is, has something we have done. We had this problem with OpenJDK Java for Java 7, because it needed Java 7 to build. So how you build Java 7 that needs Java 7 when you don't have Java 7? It's been a long time, so I'm not quite sure of whether we use it GCJ, which is the GNU compiler for Java on all the steps, or at some point we could switch to OpenJDK Java on an earlier version. But it went like this. You first use it GCC to build GCJ for Java 5. And so you could build that with a C compiler. And then you use it, it to build a newer GCJ, uh, I don't remember, which, is, which was the Java or open JDK for Java 5. And then you use it Java 5 to build Java 6, and Java 6 to build Java 7. So we eventually got to Java 7. 
I'm sorry, I really don't recall the details or which package is, uh, and I was lazy to go check the source code to see when they started uh, using Java. So, but it was something like that. It, it was really cool. <coughs> and by far the most um, widespread problem is this lib2 problem. Because several packages with build shared libraries depend on lib2 to detect which architecture it's running on and to configure the build options for the compiler to build your shared libraries. Uh, but it happens that many packages ship a copy of the lib2 files and they are outdated whenever you add a new architecture to them. So when they try to build, they were detecting our PowerPC64 little engine as just PowerPC64, which is big engine. So when it, when it was running the configure script, it failed to build a shared library. So it told you know, the packages, hey, don't build the shared libraries. It don't work here. But unfortunate, unfortunately, the build process continued and the package might be built and successfully. And it's a problem because you, if you don't see that during build time, we usually hate that when we are installing another package that depends on the package with ships this shared library and it couldn't find it, so it failed to run. So we had to go all the way back, rebuild this one, and you know, it was a, a performance hit. Um, we also, the solution for that is to run auto reconf uh, when you're building, which uses, you know, it kind of updates the, so the this local package from the system lib2, which can be updated to carry your, your patches for the new architecture. There's even this dev helper option that runs that automatically when you're building the dev package. But some packages have problems with that and they fail to build once you enable that thing. Uh, mostly because they depend on older versions of some of the tools that auto reconf, some of the tools that auto reconf runs. So one workaround for that is you patch just enough of the files to detect the new architecture correctly. And then another workaround, which we never sent upstream, was a patch for the linker, which forced it to run in, to link in little engine mode, even if it was specified to link in big engine mode. It was LD force little engine equals one as the environment variable. Uh, and so they rebuilt the world. We had to do that two times, if I recall correctly. And it means to rebuild everything, really, from the scratch. It happens when you have very basic changes like to your toolchain, your ABI, or your C library, and that changes might affect all the software that you have already built with that. So you have to build all over to make sure your binaries get the new changes. We did that two times, and just a hint, you, have, you should have most of your bootstrap process automated because it's a, a real pain. The first time we did that was with the introduction with this ELF v2 ABI, which is version 2, for a little engine 64 bit PowerPC. Because big engine 64 bit PowerPC used an ABI that was conceived like 20 or so years ago. And when it was conceived back then, things were really different for our programs. They were, you know, long programs with very long functions, there were very small loops that run forever. Uh, there were no, no many function calls. But more recent software, you know, the programming languages that we have nowadays are more modular, they're shorter, they make lots of function calls. And, you know, that ABI was not really optimal to do that. But we couldn't change that ABI because they had 20 years of programs that were built and uh, published elsewhere. So you can't break them. But this time, this little engine PowerPC 64 bit was new, there was no software ever published to the world with that, so we had an opportunity to change the ABI. So the toolchain guys did it. They created this ELF version 2 ABI, which is based on ELF v1, most of it ac actually, but some changes for these modern programming languages, uh, more function calls, a smaller stack size, uh, you can pass more parameters into registers, so it's really cool. It's another talk on, on its own. It's very interesting stuff. So when we initially built the world, we used the Alpha version one ABI because we already have time for questions. Okay, okay. Uh, finishing. Uh, we used the first version because we had a lot of stuff to validate that it was working with our patches already. So 
we did that, and once we checked that our two chain in the kernel was good enough, we moved the ABI, so we built everything again. The second time was a change in the glibc minimal version for Little Engine 6 for BTPC Power PC. I don't get it very well, but apparently it's a symbol that's carried in all the binaries that you, you produce that link against that glibc. And so we first started with Ubuntu and SUSE for this Little Engine Power PC. And when RHEL joined it later, it used a glibc 217. But so we could run the same binaries uh, everywhere. Those that didn't depend on a specific distro, we had to rebuild all that. And we had very cool patches from Red Hat to fake the version number so during rebuild or runtime. So that make the process easier. Uh, the, to finish here, the biggest challenge that we have had, it, that is we always were a small team, always less than 10 people, of non-Debian developers. Debian developers, a Debian developer is a title in the Debian community, which essentially tells you are really great at doing Debian. And we had little to no experience with Debian at all when we started. So it was really challenging. We had to learn a lot of stuff. And then by the end of 2013, like six months later, when Canonical was bootstrapping Ubuntu server for, for that architecture, they helped us quite a lot because they had a great team with lots of Debian developers and they bootstrapped Ubuntu. And then the patches that worked for them, we kind of took that and uh, upstreamed that for Debian so Debian could work too. And the Debian community and maintainers were very supportive to us. Uh, this timeline essentially tells that we, in six months, had to do lots of work to Debian so that Canonical could pick it over later. And then in like more one year, we had uh, this architecture building uh, one and a half year, 90% of the Debian archive upstream in Debian. So it was quite fast. In like two years, it made an official architecture in the Debian JS release, which was really a great mark. So the takeaway from this is really to close. There's this quote which I really like a lot, which are the obstacles in the path are not really obstacles. Sometimes they are the path actually. And this process is quite difficult, lots of obstacles, but it's just how it had to be done. And this is where I asked you to remember the third link in the cross to chain build description. Uh, that page tells you that sometimes you're building things that are so complex and there are so many things going wrong that you think that I must be doing the wrong thing. But sometimes it's just how things have to be done. It's the right thing to do. So that's it. Thank you.